Good evening, Julian. And let's um, welcome everybody this evening to episode 11 of An American Journey. And before we start, Julian, where are you today? I'm in Nice at the moment. It's very nice, Nice. So this is an American journey from the perspective of two Europeans. That's right. Okay. Always has been. One of them lives in America and one of them likes America and likes visiting whenever he can. Absolutely. And tonight we're going to talk about drug advertising. We're going to look at the pros and cons of visiting Nashville. And you'll be continuing your series on education. Without further ado, shall we go into drug advertising? Yes. Now, you chose this subject, Michael. Why did you choose it? Well, I, cho- I chose it because when I go to America... I like watching the TV, not from a perspective of what's on the programmes, but you get a flavour for American culture. Now, did you know, Julian, it's only the US and New Zealand where drug companies are allowed to advertise directly to the consumer? I did know that, yes. Good old New Zealand, huh? And what fascinates me about the adverts is that they're designed to stimulate the would-be patient to go to the doctor and say, I need this particular drug. But at the end of every advert, there's almost always a three-minute segment that says, what are the side effects of this drug? And if you listen carefully to those side effects, you never would go to your doctor and say, please prescribe it, in, in my mind. What do you think, Julian? 75% of all TV adverts in America are medication adverts. Gosh. Unless the pharmaceutical companies have it completely wrong, there must be a reason that they are propping up the TV industry by providing almost all of the revenue for those network companies to exist. I'm guessing that they know that the adverts work for them. I did a bit of research myself. It's a bit dated, 2014. Drug companies spent $4.5 billion on advertising. So you're right, it's a big budget item. I read another figure that for every dollar they spend on investing in a new medication, they spend $19 on the approved drugs. Okay. You assume, therefore, there must be a very significant return of investment in all these advertisements. As I understand it... What happens is that the adverts are there to help an individual go to their doctor and say, I've heard about this new drug, can you prescribe it for me? And the doctors are very willing to prescribe a new drug if they believe it's appropriate for the individual. Indeed, many doctors will ask the individual whether they have any preferred drugs that they wish to be prescribed. Okay, okay. And that's, I think, quite a big difference in Britain. So perhaps... Perhaps you'd explain the situation, you know, somebody going into their doctor in Britain. How how does that work then, Michael, for our American listeners? Very, very different. So first of all, you virtually see no adverts for prescribed drugs, only generic drugs that you can get across the counter at the pharmacist. So, you know, the drugstore. So that might be paracetamol. Medication, typically you would see the doctor. The doctor, he or she, would you know, do an examination, do a diagnostic, and, and then probably would say, I am going to prescribe you a drug. And probably even wouldn't tell you what that drug was, or if it did, or if she did, or he did. Very loose terms. This is to ease your back pain. In fact, if you wanted to really know what the drug was, you wouldn't be able to decipher the doctor's writing on the prescription form, which you take to the chemist who then gives you the drug. Only at that point do you get a sense of really what the drug is. And I suspect most people don't do this, but I do. I always take out the leaflet and read what it says. And in the very long print of that, it will get the side effects. It's doing this, but it could also do that. It may be very different to the US, that you take your doctor on trust, that your doctor knows best, he or she will prescribe what they think is the most medication. And... You might very occasionally say, I've heard so about this or whatever, but very rarely. Of course, Google's changed that slightly because people now go onto Google and do absolutely do their own diagnosis. And come away. And that might be a conversation to talk to the doctor about. I think I've got such and such. But again, it would be very rare indeed for you to tell a doctor about a particular medication. What I know a little bit about is the actual marketing of drugs to doctors in the UK is quite interesting because that's all about, dare I say it, 
drug companies marketing directly to the doctor and finding ways and means of getting them to prescribe the drug. I talked to Dawson number one, who interns for a major pharmaceutical company this summer about this topic. And she told me in America that pharmaceutical companies were not allowed to market directly, that it had to be a doctor to doctor conversation. So it would have to be a doctor from one of the pharmaceutical companies who would attempt to market directly to that doctor. It's a very regulated field within the US. Just go back to Britain again. There's an organization called NICE as well. Would you like to explain what that is to American listeners? Uh, and you've got me not on an expert subject at all. <laughs> Remind me what NICE stands for. I, and I know of it. Yeah, NICE is the, the body which decides whether a medication makes economic sense to prescribe or not. So it looks at the various different medications that might be available and says that the National Health will pay for this one, but it won't pay for this other drug because it's more expensive. So it looks at the, you know, the economic value that that drug produces. That doesn't take place in America at all. And so not just whether it's effective, but whether the NHS can afford it. That's right. NICE is really about affordability, yeah. okay. as I understand it. Okay. So you described this experience of actually seeing a doctor and having them prescribe it, a, a medication in person. That doesn't happen that much, is it? As I understand it, seeing a doctor is about as common as, as seeing Lord Lucan on Shergar. <laughs> is that right in these, in these post-COVID t- days? I think we're in danger of upsetting a large percentage of the medical profession. But... Okay, excellent. There is no doubt, as a result of COVID, and uh, for good reasons, keeping patients out of general practices, uh, where the doctors are housed, has been the order of the day for the last 18 months. And so we absolutely have seen the rise of video or Zoom calls such as this by way of diagnostics. It's also, though, come at the same time, to make a political point, that the GPs have been very keen to sort of manage their workload. And so uh, patients with sort of ailments, you know, I don't feel very well, are almost discouraged from going to see their GP and more directed to an online service, 111, or indeed turn up an A&E. And that's been a real major problem. So you're right, there has definitely been, either by design or by fault, a strategy that says... Patients find it hard to see doctors, but they still do. And indeed, online, you can request a, an appointment and you can stipulate, I want that in person. So you can get that, but not as easy as it was, say, two, three years ago. OK, right. So let's go back to these ads on American television then. So this is the structure of an ad. If, if, if you're a listener and you haven't uh, seen these adverts on television, they usually begin with telling you what the ad is about. So, for example, it might be, you know, do you have problem with sleep in your eye? If so, this new drug is much better than the existing medications that you're taking to remove sleep from your eye. Go and see your doctor and ask him to prescribe it or ask her to to, uh, prescribe it. It then has this list of all the side effects that could come from taking this drug. Diarrhea, cancer, brain tumour, death. You know, all of that type of stuff. And as you say, sometimes that list can go on for for quite a few seconds, maybe even a minute. Now, daughter number one tells me that all of that stuff is just white noise, that people, because they represent 75% of all adverts, uh, of all spend at least, and because, you know, there are 18 minutes of adverts per hour, all of those side effects have essentially become white noise and the viewer no longer hears those side effects because they're so used to being fed them as part of their adverts. Your your perspective? I I think you've missed two important um, constituents of the ad though there, Julian. Um, And these are visual. So in the first 30 seconds, you see the the patient who normally is suffering from the effects of the bad back or sleep in the eye. So... Right. And they're never they're never eighty five years old, are they? No, these patients, no, but they're always like thirty five. But they're glum looking. They're, they're, they're... 
Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're not happy. They haven't got a smile on their face, yeah. Then in the last 30 seconds, before, as, as they are running through this list of things that could happen to you, what you see is happy, smiling, recovered patient, which always took me slightly contrary to the what you see and the message you get in, because like, they don't show you anybody with the side effects, but they've all recovered. Would, is that fair in terms of the before and after approach that it adds? Oh, yeah, that's always the case. And as with all adverts these days, there's always a healthy mix of gender and ethnicity. Yes, yes. And interesting, some of the topics can be somewhat sensitive. So you know, erectile dysfunction appears very frequently on them, doesn't it? And sort of issues like the menopause or, you know, uh, you know all sorts of... Uh, so if you're having your, your breakfast while you're watching this television, you have got <laughs> to sort of think, hmm, do I really want to know about... <laughs> colon cancer or whatever we're talking about. I thought you'd be making a note of those medications, Michael. <laughs> I think I think Julian, you you're being somewhat sort of naughty this evening, Julian. Yeah. I can see <laughs> so, spending time in the south of France has broadened your horizons. <laughs> One of the points that clearly shows that they do work is the number of people who take medication. You know, whenever I go to the dentist, I'm always asked you know, are you taking any medications? And when I say, no, I'm not taking any medications, they look at me as if nobody's ever said that to them before. As if they're expecting you to reel off six or seven medications that you're taking. And indeed, I looked into the statistics. Uh, in the UK, 26% of all adults take some medication at any one time or in any one year, uh, whereas the similar figure in the US is over 70%. That includes almost every person over 65 who are predominantly the people who watch TV. You're talking about marketing directly to a consumer audience that is likely to want to take a medication because that's the nature of the, of the culture in the US compared to, say, the UK. That's the economics of it, Julian. What's your view on the effectiveness of all these prescriptions? I mean, are we saying as a result of this, Americans get better health care? Well, health care is a really big mm. subject, and we'll perhaps come on to that in another week, because I think that uh, probably does merit a, a, a longer and more in-depth conversation. But in terms of life expectancy, which is one outcome, mm. clearly Americans do not live twice as long as, uh, as people in Britain. In fact, they live their uh, life expectancy is slightly lower than in Britain. It's not at all clear that these medications are, are meeting that, that end goal of, uh, of living longer. So let me ask the question in a slightly different form then. So uh, certainly in the UK, the vast majority of expenditure goes in what I call medical interventions, i.e. we're treating somebody. A very small percentage on preventative health, like stop smoking, take more exercise. Uh, as a result of this approach to you know, uh, going directly to the consumers, do you think that impacts on better outcomes on preventive health as opposed to health interventions? I genuinely don't know the answer to that. I did read the website of the lobbying organisation for the pharmaceutical companies because there are some people in America who believe that advertising direct to consumers should be banned as it is in all but one other country. And their argument is that it allows the industry to educate consumers directly, it allows the consumer to take control of those chronic conditions rather than be a victim of those chronic conditions. Not a direct answer to your question, but I did, I did actually go to the website of the lobbyist for the pharmaceutical companies. Are there some of these things which are preventative? Yes, there are. I mean, there are, you know, a number of people who take medications which essentially are, you know, helping them prevent serious illnesses in the future. Yeah. On a serious note, I mean, there is no doubt, uh, although we make fun of the you know, the side effects, I suspect the American population has a greater knowledge of both the pros and cons of medication than the UK, where it's very rare there's any conversation around what are the side effects of this drug. You, it's just taken on right. the face that, well, the doctor knows best and he's prescribing what's best for you. He, he or she would very rarely say to you, oh, and by the way, understand that it, these are side effects. And of course, the side effects are only there because the regulation that's in place insists that they're there. 
It's not that the yeah. the the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies are out of the goodness of their heart educating people on the side effects. It's because they have to say that they yeah. can't do an advert without talking about the side effects for which the drug has been approved. Okay, so summing up then, Julian, sort of. Uh, drug advertising on TV directly to the patient. Where do you stand? Good idea, bad idea? Well, I don't watch television, so it doesn't really bother me the fact that there are loads of adverts on something I don't watch. So I don't care from that perspective. From a sort of wider social perspective, I can see both sides of the argument, I think. don't really like the British system, which is, hey, there's this expert and this expert is going to be in charge of your health. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that, um, you know, with that scenario. The huge percentage of Americans who are on medication, I think, has to be a negative, doesn't it? So on balance, from what I know, which is limited, I would say I think there are probably better systems than the American one. And can I just briefly take us to a cul-de-sac? Because you say you don't watch television, but I know you watch lots of films. First of all, in American theatres, do they have advertising between films? Not really. No, it's not like in Britain. In in Britain, if you watch a, a movie at the cinema, there'll be a few adverts at the beginning. In America, there are some adverts, but they all relate to the drinks and refreshments that you can enjoy in watching the movie they don't advertise the local indian takeaway which is which is what they do in uh, in british cinema michael what is it that you like about nashville you're probably going to think i'm going to say it's all yeehaw Country music. Walking down the main street and hearing Tammy Wynette coming out of every single bar. No, it is not, Julian. What I'm going to go and say, surprise, surprise, it's a building. Okay, which building, Mike? We're talking about a railway station. The Union Station. (laughs) Now, did you know... Prior to, obviously, they close the railways. I think it's safe to say, if you're going to talk about railways, and you're beginning with, did you know, then my answer is likely to be no. That's why I asked the question. There used to be eight railways. Ask the question anyway. Did you know there was eight railroads going into Nashville? Eight. I did not know that. And sadly, the last one, the Floridian, from Chicago to Miami, ceased in the 70s. Now, the reason why you should go to see the building, it is a fantastic piece of architecture. And the really good news is that there's no trains there. No, no trains at all. That's brilliant. I mean, that's the best feature of any railway station I could think of. No trains. It, it's now a Marriott Hotel. It's that good. When I went there, there was a light show involving Queen, which was fantastic on the ceiling. Fantastic crystal chandeliers. Two sculptors. Miss Nashville and Miss Louisville, which reportedly was the daughter of the architect. And on the very... Well, I'm quite surprised you pronounced Louisville correctly. Yeah, I'm getting better at this, Julian. Surprise, surprise. And at the very top of the building is a Roman gold Mercury. Not the original. It's the third one they've had. The first one did oh. survive a, a tornado. I can't remember what it's like when he got knocked down. But... To see the building, if you and if you want to go online and look at it, it's a magnificent piece of architecture. That's the reason you should go hmm. to Nashville. Okay, sounds interesting. I might next time I'm in Nashville, I might take a visit there. Is there anything else no, in well, Nashville is. that you think? Now, Julie, you're in. Are you going to Greece for your holidays this year? Greece? Yes. No. Athens. I mean, they call Nashville the Athens of the South, don't they? Do they? I didn't know that, Julian. Yeah, they do, except there is an Athens of the South, which is in Georgia. It's called Athens. <laughs> it's where the University of Georgia is. Yeah. And so that name is a terrible name. And Nashville is not the Athens of the South, in my view. That would be Athens. Okay. But there is a, a Greek building. Are you aware of this Greek building? I, I was taking us down that path. Right, the Parthenon. The Parthenon. In fact, I was hoping you were going to pronounce that, Julian, because I was always going to have trouble with it. 
Oh no! What were you going to say? I missed your chance. <laughs> no, to I'm, not you. I'm not taking you there now. You've told me it, but it was. It's in the middle of Centennial Park, and again, my understanding is originally that was built in ooh, 1895 for the exposition. Yeah, they used to have in America late 19th, early 20th centuries. Expositions were the order of the day, and they were really throughout America. There were loads and loads of them. World Fair, those type of things. They had one in Nashville. For this exposition, they built an exact copy, full-size copy, of the Parthenon as it would have looked if it had still been intact. And you can go and visit this exact copy today. And I just take you up on the date. I think it's 1897 this was built. It is actually quite interesting to go and see that. I saw it on a Sunday morning and I enjoyed it a lot. And my number three, so I've given you my top two. My number three is a hop on, off, off trolley bus tour across Nashville. Did you see downtown Nashville area? Nashville is one of these places where there are lots of bachelorette parties. Yeah. Did you see a group of women on these bicycle drinking machines did you we see did, that we did and, and and you say downtown i mean it's really effect I, I don't want to be disrespectful but it's really one street isn't it one street with lots of bars in comparison to places well, like vegas it's small there is actually a downtown area of nashville i would actually recommend if you're going to go there again i'd recommend you go to that and that is different from broadway which is i think the, the one street yeah. you're talking about with all the music if you do go to Nashville again, I would recommend that you go to actual downtown. There are a couple of faded hotels there which are very uh, nice. It's not that far away from Broadway. Nashville isn't just one street. I can't remember how big the city is. It's a small city. Your wife wasn't tempted to go on one of those drink as much as you can, cycle around a Nashville centre on, on one of those bikes? No. Uh, uh, not necessarily because of the drink as much as you can, but the cycling, I think, would have put her off. So there is one other feature to talk about. They've got a very impressive NFL stadium, haven't they? I haven't been to it, actually. Uh, tell me about well, it. it, and, it, it and, and it's on the other side of the river. I presume it's relatively new, but it's a beautiful stadium where the Tennessee Titans play. Is that correct? That's where the Tennessee Titans play, but I've not been to the stadium. I think it's on the same side of the river as Vanderbilt University. Yeah. Which itself is an interesting university to go and visit. I've not been to a game there. Sounds like you didn't go to no, a game there a either. Game. Is that no, what you're saying? We were out of the season. Isn't there an ice hockey team as well? Yes, there is. There is. Are you ready for it? Yeah, go on. Tell me what their name the is. Nash- <laughs> Nashville Predators. The Nashville Predators? Yes. Well, that's very um, unpolitically correct, isn't it? Well, and the only time they got to the Stanley Cup final, do you know who they played? You don't, do you? No. No, I, I, I don't, actually. I, I don't really follow uh, ice hockey, so I... Pittsburgh Penguins. You the couldn't Penguins make it up, could you? Penguins versus the Predators. Yeah, Predators <laughs> versus Penguins. Uh, and interestingly, the Penguins won. <laughs> yeah. That's not the right order of things, is it? No, absolutely not. Okay, so can I talk about some of the things that you missed, which, you know, the normal person might do in Nashville? Oh, before you go into that, can I also say where they play? They play at the Bridgestone Arena. They and, do. And I yep. need to point which out... Which is a tyre manufacturer. Yeah, that's right. As a result of the hop-on, off-on tour we did, we discovered that Elton John was playing there in his very long farewell tour that evening at the arena... That was the following night from the ice hockey. Oh, and was he good, Elton? He was excellent. I was disappointed by the ice hockey. It was a TV game. And every time the play just got going, we broke for adverts. Linked to first session. Lots of adverts in ice hockey, I presume. Very disjointed game. I know I'm going to alienate all the ice hockey fans here. But ice hockey is actually quite a difficult game to follow because it's so fast that it's very difficult to always see where the puck is. Whereas in other sports, you can usually see where the ball is, where this one, this game is so quick that actually somebody scored and you haven't even seen that it's scored other than by the reaction of the players. As a sport to go and spectate at, it's it's not my favourite sport. Well, in defence, 
obviously currying favour with ice hockey. If you see it, certainly in the UK, and I don't know whether you've seen the Guildford Flames when you were there. Yeah, used to go when they were there. Mm -hmm. If it's not televised, it's an all-action game. I mean, it really is. People coming on and off the high seats. It moves quickly, not to mention the punch-ups. It's a Whereas when I saw it in uh, Nashville, I was very disappointed because it was like two minutes and it would stop. Another two, three minutes and it would stop. No fights? Because that always seems to be the big attraction of ice hockey. Uh, there was, there was a couple of up. fights, but you know, I mean, it, but as I said, it was, it was so disjointed, it never got going. That was the problem because of the adverts. So tell me what I missed. I don't know whether you know this, Michael, but Nashville is a music city. No, you don't say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's not just country music, although it is country music. Really, they pretty much do most music these days. If you go down Broadway, to Broadway is this long street and it is essentially full of bars. I don't know how many there are there, but between 50 and 100, in each of these bars features musicians. And the quality of these musicians is outstanding. Because if you're in the music business, you're probably going to be basing yourself near Nashville because that's where all the other musicians are. So the quality of these bands, even at a band playing at 11 in the morning on a Saturday morning, is going to be really, really high, higher than any other place that you might care to visit. And this is not your country music of old. So it's not your Hank Williams, your Willie Nelson You know, New Country is about these impossibly good-looking pop Adonises, essentially. You know, people like Thomas Rhett, Luke Bryan, Dirk Bentley, Chris Jansen, those type of people. And it's very accessible music. It's a crossover between country and pop. You know, they have the best catchy tunes. And I like that type of music, I have to say. I, I didn't care for country music before I went to the States. But on going to the States, I actually... You know, many of the the bands that I prefer to go and see are are notionally country stars. On Broadway, if you're if you're in Nashville, go to one of the very many bars along Broadway, and you'll see lots of excellent music. They play all hours. Obviously, in the evening, those are more popular. So, if you don't like the large crowds, then go in the afternoon or something. But uh, it's a terrific place to to go. Still on the music theme, the big place to go is the Grand Ole Opry, which is a big historical music venue. There are a number of stadiums there which house all of the uh, the big bands like Elton that you were talking about. There's a place I've been a couple of times called the Gaylord Opry Lands Resort, which again has lots of music and is one of these sort of Vegas style resort hotels. And there's things like the Country Music Hall of Fame. So if you like music, I think Nashville is a great place to go. And I think you'll enjoy the diversity of music that you can hear there. Did you go and listen to any of this I music? Did. I did. I, I, I listened to all bands in the street. But I, I go back to the Grand Old Opry. It's not the Old Opry because the Old Opry is still in Nashville. They've recreated it outside, haven't they? So I don't know. Yeah, that's right. It's it's outside Nashville. So a couple of other things. I, I certainly would recommend the Parthenon, which we talked about earlier on. There's a home of a former president, President Andrew Jackson, his home called Hermitage. That is well worth seeing. He's not my favourite president, but his house is definitely a very important historical place. Also, I mean, not in Nashville, but outside Nashville, There are lots of very nice lakes and you can get yourself a small house, buy a lake, maybe a boat. In the summer, you can enjoy the beach-like entertainment on one of these lakes. There's a lot to like about Nashville. Anything you didn't like about Nashville? No, I'm I'm going to one more thing I did like since we're now outside of Nashville, but within easy travelling distance. Cheatwood, their botanical gardens. Very nice. Oh, I haven't been there. What was that like? We were in there in October... So it was sort of Halloween themed, really pleasant, nice gardens from memory, a nice Chinese garden, 55 acres, lots of art features, uh, uh, sculptures and things. So very good indeed. And how would you compare it to, say, New Orleans? Ooh, um, as a garden... Because you you had this, uh, this rating system, which seems to change every episode, where we used to mark it out of five last time you went to comparing it to where they would appear in the Premiership League table, 
How would you compare Nashville to, say, New Orleans? That's a very good question. I think New Orleans has got slightly more to it. I would say, say, three or four days in New Orleans, but I'd probably only say a couple of days in Nashville. But definitely worth going. So uh, if we're now scoring out of five all week a day, could well be the Everton or, uh, of, of the Premiership. So not quite in the top five, but there or thereabouts. So for me, a score of four out of five. Yeah, I would give it a four as well. I think it's much better for music than both Memphis and New Orleans. But I think you're right. There's a, there's a few more things to see in New Orleans. If, if I was sort of rushing through there, two days in Nashville and three days in New Orleans sounds about right. And I suppose if for UK visitors thinking of going, assuming you want to go to Memphis, if you are, you, you're doing a sort of country music or music tour, then Nashville would yeah. definitely be a place you would call it out to get to Memphis. Right. There's a common tour which goes to those three places. So it goes Nashville... Memphis, it then takes the back roads down to New Orleans. That's a fairly typical road trip that many Americans do. Julian, continuing our theme of compare and contrast US and UK education... I believe tonight you're going to talk about sports and music. This week, we're going to talk about music and sport at high school. Both form a critical part of the structure of schooling in America. Between the age of roughly 12 and 14, at least in our school district, music is one of the compulsory six lessons every day. The school board treats it on a par with math, English, foreign language, social studies and science. I asked table kicking daughter number one why music is so important in middle school when it would not be so prominent in a UK setting at the same age. You had to take music as a subject every single day. Right, for three years. For three years. And why was that? They believed that kids were going to be able to succeed academically if they could read sheet music. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of them came out without being able to read sheet music. That so that they saw a correlation between music ability and academic ability. Yes. And from that correlation, they assumed that being good at music caused you to be good at, at, in your academic subjects. Yes. Ignoring the question of whether correlation necessarily meant any causation, I asked my daughters what choices they had for music at that age. Orchestra, band, and choir, or chorus is what they call it. Okay. Which one did the cool kids do? Chorus. Okay. And which one did you do? Chorus. I chose choir because it was known as the easy option. (laughs) And it definitely was the easy option, even though not really because I couldn't sing. At high school, music continues to be essential, but it is less compulsory. Here's daughter number one to explain. You have to take at least one semester of music to graduate. Mm Mm-hmm. But some people presumably take music for every year of their high school because yeah. they like music. Our neighbour, she was in the school band. She took band for every year of high school. The way that they practice for band playing at the football games is often in band class in the day. Okay. So you can't be part of the after-school band without being in the in-school band. Okay, I didn't, and didn't know that. chorus and orchestra. How many people were in the school band at your high school? So I would say... 200 people in the in-day band, Mm because they had one class of band every single period. Right. Um, And then 100 people in the after-school band. Right. And then you had also the colour guard and people like that that added up, you know, maybe another 25 people. Okay. Every day, the students in the band, they will be having one of their classes, which would be music or band. And then after school, school every day, they would be rehearsing. Probably for about two to three hours. Two to three hours, wow. So they've got their three hours homework, and then they've got the three hours band. And that's... that's just during football season now. I went to a UK school with a world-renowned marching band. As a tangential piece of trivia, my school band was first proposed in 1728 by Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe thought by some to be the writer of the first English novel, but certainly 
the writer of one of the dullest books ever written. My school band had lots of practice. They played their music every day as we marched into meals. They also perform at countless events. They always lead out the Lord Mayor's Parade in London. They play at numerous sporting events, cricket, rugby and even American football. Finally, the Queen seems to like to have them play at her very many Jubilee events. As good as my old school band is, I would say that the quality of many of the school bands in America is equally high. Most US school bands sport bizarre uniforms, perhaps not as outlandish as my school uniform, but still strange nonetheless. The marching style of the US high school band is less traditional than in the UK. The bands here perform more complex geometric movements while they march. They perform in every local parade, of which there are many in America, and compete with other school bands around the US in competitions. However, the most important place they perform is at the high school football game. And they work really, really, really hard. Definitely harder than anybody on the field, I would say, because right. they're out practicing every day for about 12 hours. The quality of the band is really good, isn't it? Yeah. If you are in America and on a Friday night in football season, which is in the autumn, then go along to a high school go and watch a high school game and in particular at half time during other parts of the game look at how good the bands are they are really quite exceptional yes they are this segues into the second element of our topic today sport at high school i asked daughter number two what were the most popular sports at high school football or baseball oh baseball is is of equal Level yes, at my high school, it definitely was just because we had a really, really, really strong baseball team. And so the kids that were on it, they all ended up committing to colleges to play D1. D1 stands for Division I. These are the universities with the highest standard of college sports. More of that later. Before that, other sports are played at high school too. Here's daughter number two with her list. Lacrosse at our school was quite popular. Mm -hmm. Swimming, gymnastics. I believe your high school was the state champion at cricket, is that right? Yes, my junior year maybe they were the state champion at cricket. Mm -hmm. And that British people may be surprised to hear that an American high school would play cricket. Yeah, we had a very large population of American Indian at our high school. And we also had a disproportionate number of, of British and South African students than other high schools in the region. Okay. So therefore you won the cricket. Yes, because we had people that knew how to play cricket. Right. If it wasn't high standard, we went to watch the national championship. I agree. I, I was there and that I was I could not have competed nice. on the team. Possibly. She didn't mention basketball, wrestling, track and field, cross country, volleyball, competitive cheer, softball, golf, tennis, and soccer. There is a lot of sport played after school in American high schools, and most of it played to a high standard. I asked daughter number one how many students played sport at high school. Almost all of them. Almost all at of them. At least for the beginning of their high school career, before okay. the academics caught up. And in the UK, do you know how much sport is played within the school in the UK environment? Most sport is not played within the school environment in the UK. And that's just based on funding. Just uh, the, the US allocate a lot of funding and they also have a lot of school spirit for their school. So you have right. a lot of donations that are directly earmarked to the football department or the wrestling department or the baseball by alumni in order to see their team succeed. The sad fact is that there is much less competitive sport now played at UK state schools. In the 1980s, the Conservative government allowed schools to sell their sports fields. Over the next decade, UK schools sold 5,000 playing fields to pay for other educational priorities. Not surprisingly, pupils spending more than two hours a week on sport halved during this same period. While later governments changed policy, schools continued to sell playing fields and sports participation continued to drift lower. The exception to this pattern is at UK private schools, which have kept their playing fields. 
Not surprisingly, therefore, there are a disproportionate number of British professional athletes from private school backgrounds. I asked daughter number one to describe a typical football game day. So on a Friday for or all of the games, all the football games at least, they would we would have a theme that we'd have to dress up as. So everyone mm-hmm. would come to school and paint their cars and faces um, with whatever the theme was. So the first day of the year at the high school I went to was always beach themed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so everyone would come dressed in Hawaiian shirts. My Hawaiian coconut shirts. Bra- yes, coconut bras, hula skirts with massive inflatable flamingos, you know. Okay. Things that are not practical to the learning environment, but very fun to do. Okay. Throughout the day, there'd kind of be this buzz class periods would often be shortened so that at the very end of the day, they could have a pep rally. Okay, so what's a pep rally? So a pep rally is where all the students that want to participate go to the gym. Mm -hmm. We all stand on the bleachers, arranged by year group. So seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen, all facing, you know, the upper class on one side of the gym, the lower class on the other side of the gym. So you've got 2,000 people, yes. more or less, in this gym. Yeah, and I think the size of the gym cannot be underestimated. It was a full-size basketball court on the bottom and masses of bleachers. Okay. And everyone's dressed making with noisemakers, making an awful lot of noise. Everyone kind of excited to go to the game later that day. Principal, which was probably the only time people had interactions with their headmaster mm-hmm. or principal, was on pep rally days. They'd introduce a sports team other than football that may have been successful recently. So right. the golf team won this meet this weekend, and then they all come out and everyone cheers for the golf team. There's a squad of like le- pep leaders mm-hmm. who come out, and they're called MCs at, at the school I went to, who would come out and they were always dressed the craziest. In the hallways that day, they go out with giant boom boxes between classes, blasting music. They would have a choreographed dance routine ready, Mm -hmm. um, doing all kinds of crazy flips and stuff, hype everyone up. They have a competition to see who makes most noise between the year groups and the spirit stick, just a large stick painted in the school colours, would be given to whichever grade had the best noise or spirit that day. Everyone would be hyped for the game and they'd dismiss us to go to the buses or to, to go home at that point. And then everyone would come back at... I don't know what kind of timing. It's 6 seven o'clock. PM, seven seven o'clock is when the game seven, starts. Yeah, so. so people get there at 6, 6.30 to park, paint up before the game in the car park of the school and just get hyped, I guess. There. And you would have thousands of people at a, a football game, wouldn't mm-hmm. you? I mean, you might have 5,000 people for a large high school. Yes. In fact, I think some of the Texas high schools 10, 000, have got... Yeah. No, I may think even... I think the record attendance is 50,000 which is quite exceptional for sport, which is played by mainly 18-year-olds. And what's the game itself like? I don't think most people really pay that much attention during the game. You're also stood um, in the stands or seated by hierarchy for the students. Right. So the seniors sit at the very front, juniors behind them, sophomores behind the juniors, at the very top. The, the freshmen are allocated to the very top of the bleachers. The parents, and the, they're sitting beside the band and beside the parents. At the, the cheerleaders and the MCs, again, trying to hype everyone up if there's a, a good game play. But um, people just, in general, socializing, not necessarily. This is a big stadium, game. isn't it, to fit yes. the thousands of yes. people in. Mm-hmm. And then there are, what, big video screens? Which... Yeah, massive video screen. Well, no, I mean, our school didn't have a video screen. Mm-hmm. It just had, like, a big scoreboard. But some of the newer schools do have video screens. You can watch these games on television, can't you? Some there's... of these games you can watch yeah. on television. The big rival games, so the high school I went to and their rival high school, they would televise in on local television mm-hmm. because the attendance was always really large and people couldn't necessarily come to the game but wanted to still watch it. And did you like going to a high school football game? Yeah, I liked high school football games. It's a nice atmosphere to be in. I asked daughter number one why parents were so keen on having their children play sports. Because for many parents who are middle of the road income wise it's the only way they can see without taking out massive loans to support their children into university because if you're very good top level at a sport you can go to university in the u.s for free many parents they encourage their children to pay sports and they will pay a lot of money for them to be good in the sport right because they know they're probably going to save up to two hundred thousand dollars down the road if their child is good enough some parents i understand 
delay their children going to school by a year so that they give their children a slightly higher chance of being good at sport and getting one of these scholarships. They say it's to do with the development of the child. So no one will tell you I delayed my kid because I wanted him to be bigger than the other kids. They're immature because they're a boy. Um, and they say, oh, well, my friend's daughter is much more mature, but really they're marking it based on the idea that they might be better at football if they're slightly bigger. They'll be slightly faster. Most people graduate to 18, but there were quite a few 19-year-olds, and they tended to be boys who delayed their education by a year, and they were also, most of them were in the football team. Yes. Dawson number two describes how the university recruitment process works. The way that it works is that the university recruiters will come to sporting events and games because they are trying to make their teams the strongest. You would get offers to certain schools. And, and those offers were, would be what they call a full ride, wouldn't it? Is they would pay for their tuition, they would pay for their food, they would housing, pay for their accommodation, yes. everything. Yes, not everybody was lucky enough to get a full ride, but obviously some of the students that wouldn't be able to get into college usually could use football or baseball or whatever it was to their advantage to get an education reduced or free. Right. And maybe in a university that they their academic performance uh, wouldn't have merited. So yes. you might get a, a place at a, an Ivy League school uh, as long as you weren't too stupid, you were bright enough and you were good at sports, you would get one of those places. Next week, in part six of our series on education, we will discuss discipline in schools and the topic of school shootings. As always, thank you so much for listening. We do appreciate your time. We also appreciate your reviews. And I'm going to have a call out tonight to Sean because Sean said on episode 10, an excellent episode. Please, please, please rate us on your favourite podcast provider. Please, please, please send us reviews. If you like the podcast, promote it on social media so that other people might enjoy the podcast too. And you'll see that Julian and I frequently comment on LinkedIn on the podcast. So again, very happy to take uh, subjects for further discussion. Which leads me to next week's episode, Julian. Yeah, what's on next week's episode? Well, air conditioning. You'll tell me why in a moment. Obviously, we're going to continue our series on education, and this time school discipline and school shootings. I thought it was reading school outings, but it's got to be America, school shootings. <laughs> and lastly... You know, they don't do much in the way of school outings. Oh, can you, can you remember your first school outing, Julian? Yeah, it was to a place called Moor Wellham. Well, the first one I remember is to a place called Moor Wellham, which is in Devon. This is how industries were in a previous age type place. Oh, uh-huh. well, my first one was to a, a carillion. Do you know what a carillion is? A carillion? A carillion. No, what is a carillion? It's a uh, bell tower in Loughborough. I think it was about five-year-olds we were taken to a carillion. I'll leave it with you that. Why you would take five-year-olds to see a bell carillion, I do not know. But there we are, my first school trip. When my children were in um, Hong Kong for their school trip... One of them went to Borneo yes. for their school trip, <laughs> oh, yeah. and the other ones went to Beijing. So I think there's been quite a lot of inflation in uh, in school trip experiences since our day, Michael. Yeah, I, th- I think a trip out to Loughborough from Belper does not compare to Borneo or wherever. And, and lastly, we're going to talk about Yosemite, another one of my favourite places. Any final words, Julian, Julian from your holiday in, in, in Nice? No, it's very nice, though, Nice. The water's very warm. they got 90-something museums. We've been trying to see as many of them as we can. We've been enjoying a relatively quiet Nice because there aren't that many tourists here. What is it that you like about Nashville? I have been looking forward to this topic. You probably think I'm going to say, well, yee-haw, it's the country music and walking down the main street and hearing 
Camus and Winnette coming out of every single bar? No, it's not that. I could say it could be the Bridgestone Arena, where I managed to see both the ice hockey team. Do you know what the ice hockey team's called? No. Predators. I'm sorry, say that again. Predators. What did you say? What did you say? The ice hockey team, National Predators. Yep. I'm sure they don't say it like National, that. Pre- National Predators. Nashville Predators. Oh, Nashville. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Okay, let's start this bit again. I, I honestly can't understand what you're saying. Predators. P E R D A T O R S. Predators. What are they? Well, what's a predator? Uh, you tell me. That's what the, that is what the, the ice hockey team's called. Ah, the ice hockey team. Okay. Okay, right, let's... I'm probably going to have to do some heavy editing of this yeah. bit. So I'll start again. So I'll start again. So I'll start again. So I'll start again. So I'll start again.